Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to How Agents Find Their Niche and Succeed. My name is Cleve Gaddis, and I'm coming to you actually today from Salt Lake City, where it is overcast, rainy, and threatening to get down into the low 30s, so it'll be interesting to see whether or not we have any snow this afternoon. I'm not far from all of our panelists. We've got panelists from Denver, and we've got panelists uh, from Las Vegas as well. Just in case you're wondering what qualifies me to moderate one of these webinars, I happen to be a coach with Workman Success Systems. I do coaching and consulting, but I also still run a real estate team uh, in Metro Atlanta. So I'm doing the same things that you're doing every single day. And I'm so delighted that you are here. I wanna make sure that we do a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions, you'll see you have a questions panel. If you notice me looking away from the screen, it's because I'm looking at the questions panel. If you have questions that you want to ask any of the panelists at any time, you just go right ahead. I will see those questions. I'll make sure we get as many of them asked as possible as we go through today's webinar. If you have any difficulties, also you can post that in the questions box and someone from RIS Media is going to be monitoring that and we'll try to help you with any technical difficulties. And now here's the real treat. You got to stay on until the very end because we've got a special free giveaway for you that will help you move forward with the information that you're going to hear today from the panelists. And I am so excited to be able to help you. We have got a great sponsor when I'm not moderating these. I love to listen to them because it has some of the best panelists, some of the best and brightest minds in real estate in the U.S. sharing ideas about how they've grown their own business. And there's no exception today. But let's go in and recognize our sponsor is Homes.com and HomeSnap. Uh, specifically home snap showings, which in even the panelists have not heard this before, which is going to be a competitor to showing time, which all, we all know is owned by Zillow. So I noticed Colton uh, smiling when I said that. So John was supposed to be on with us from home snap, uh, homes.com. Unfortunately, he is under the weather today. So I'm going to sort of handle this for him. But the long story short is uh, home snap has come out with home snap showings which is a competitor to showing time. It allows you to schedule all the showings. You can put a link in the listing service. Some of the listing services are actually already connected. So it would be internal to the listing service, sort of like uh, showing time is at this point. And so if you have any questions or you need additional information, just search home snap showings and reach out and ask them for more information. I personally, uh, Michelle and Moore and Colton was very excited when they said that because I'm like it didn't it kind of bothers me that that I'm having showings and I'm giving all my showing information to uh, a, an organization that I consider to be a competitor so uh, it actually worried me just a little bit so um, it, it, home snap showing is included with home snap pro subscription and you can have it at no additional cost you just got to get it signed up and get started so as we get rolling just real quickly I want to introduce our panelists all of the panelists happen to be private coaching clients of mine, so I know them and I know their businesses very, very well. And so I'm probably, actually, I'm not even going to use the bios. I'm going to tell everybody what I think uh, about each one of you because I totally freaking look up to all of you guys. You're amazing business people. Um, even though I'm your coach, I learn a lot from you guys in terms of how to do business. But first, we have Colton Simmons, uh, who is uh, a broker in Las Vegas. Uh, the name of his business is Custom Fit Real Estate. You can see it right on his hat. And long story short, uh, he has a background in the construction industry. So he's taken that background and he's applied it uh, into the real estate space. And I think you're going to hear some unique uh, marketing tips and systems for helping sellers sell homes today that might help you with options to attract more seller business in 2022. Colton is also a wonderful leader who is constantly trying to improve and to grow himself personally so that he can help those agents who work for him. So Colton, I'm very, very happy to have you here. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. We've also got more Zucker and Michelle uh, Cardulo. I am so sorry. I always butcher your last name. Correct me on that, Michelle. How do I pronounce it? Chardulo. Correct. Good Chardulo. job. Chardulo. Sorry. I should know yes. that because you and I have talked about it several times. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, and they are business partners at Team Denver Homes in Denver, Colorado. Uh, they are exceptionally good business women. Uh, they have both built wonderful brands for themselves and they have a great career. In fact, I would say a career that, that, that most women uh, in the U.S. and men, for that matter, would be jealous of and would actually be interested in having. But they have created a business model that creates these different brands for everybody on their team. And, is it a, and it is a fascinating concept. So welcome more and welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining today. 
I'm going to jump right into Colton first and just have some discussions and then more. And Michelle, I'll probably ask you to chime in on some of these things. And you might even have some questions you'd like to ask Colton and probably vice versa. But my first question for you, Colton, is why does a real estate agent need to consider having a niche? Because the reality is there's plenty of business out there for everybody. So why can't an agent just be everything to everybody? And, and wouldn't that get them more business? Well, there's a, there, there's a reason why, uh, you know, brain doctors make a whole lot more than general practitioners. And, and, and it goes back to what Zig Ziglar used to say is, are you going to be a meaningful specific or are you going to be a wandering generality? Um, you know, people can appreciate if you are a meaningful specific to them and their needs. And that's why I've created a niche. Not every, if you're trying to please everybody, it, yeah. it's just not going to happen. And so that's where I've tried to really specific on who's my client. And I want to try to, with my niche, or as you say, niche, I want to try to attract those types of people. Um, you know, there's some people that I, I can't really bring a whole lot of value to. And I know that and I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable with that. I just need to focus on the specific, they call it an avatar maybe, of who I can help the most and bring the most value to them. And so that's why I think a niche is, it's, it's understanding yourself and the people that you can help and benefit the most and really specifically focusing on that uh, for your business. And I think ultimately it's gonna bring you more success in the long run. And, and, and so one of the most interesting things you said was basically you're willing to forego some business in order to get all the business with the people, with the people that you will actually connect with. And I would imagine that's a concept that is foreign to most of the people who are listening, meaning, oh my gosh, I'm trying to get to eight or 10 or 12 or 15 sales a year. So I can't imagine not wanting to work with somebody that doesn't fit sort of my brand or doesn't fit my personality. But it seems like you have focused on a specific niche of the market and your business is successful. Is that right? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, when I first started and I was trying to be everything to everybody, the best year I had was, um, you know, maybe 19 transactions. This year we're at 174 transactions because we're specific about what we do and who we help. Um, and, and one of the first books I ever read talked about the 80-20 principle. 80% 80 of the people you work with um, come up with, uh, they, they, they are 20% of your income. But there's 20% of the people you work with that's 80% of your income. Yeah. And so I try to get rid of as many of the people that are the, I call them time leeches, because the people that you don't connect with are going to become time leeches and it takes you away from your real business. And, uh, and, I, and I think that that was powerful to me. And I'm glad that that was one of the first books I ever read that talked about that 80-20 principle because it made me very specific on who I was working with. Because there was those, those people that you showed 40 houses to and they still just weren't sure if they, you know, and, and I know I got a guy in mind right now that if he would have bought the house for 475 at that time, it's worth about $985,000 now. You wow. can't tell them that. So it's, it's that principle of 80-20 and knowing who you serve the best. So it's interesting when you get hooked up with a client that might not look at the world or value who you are, it already starts as a, a fairly friction filled relationship, meaning they don't know you, you don't know them. So such an interesting concept. Well, let's jump right into um, your portion of the presentation. I have renamed uh, your uh, what your service is, and I, and I want you to explain uh, what it is, how you came up with it, but I've called it Flip Your House Yourself, meaning, so Michelle has her home in Denver. She wants to sell her home, and she looks at it and says, well, it's not in the exact right condition to sell. You can come in. You can fix the house up for her. She can sell the home, only pay you back the expenses required to get it in good shape, and she can keep all the profits. And when I say all the profits, if I could spell it out, it would be all capital letters, all of of the profit. So it's really a cool concept. Talk to us about this a little bit, please. So I was actually just having a team meeting before this. And one of the things that I talked about was for some of the newer agents, I mean, when, when I first thought of this is I was going on a listing appointment and I looked at this house and I pull up, the grass is dead, the trees are dying, the original paint, the uh, original brass light fixtures in front of the house uh, that, that, that the builder put on 30 or 40 years ago. And I thought to myself, man, 
wouldn't it be great to just give this thing a little facelift and, and really give me a good marketable, uh, you know, house and, you know, help them make more money. And then I'm thinking to myself, why can't you do that? You, you've been in construction. I have a background in construction through my family business and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, well, then you talk to the, uh, the seller and they're like, well, I have $200,000, but it's equity in my house. Other than that, I'm like the 78% of Americans that don't have more than $500 in my checking account. So I can't afford to do that. Well, at that time, I couldn't afford to do it either. My first update before you list was $7,100. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. I'll take care of the cost. I probably had at that time a few hundred bucks in my checking account. So I worked something out with some of my relationships and I let them, you know, they, they were willing to wait a little bit for the money. Right. If I didn't beat them up on the price um, or, you know, I, I, I was like, Hey, I'm out of town. I'll pay you when I get back. Well, I wasn't really out of town. I was just trying to extend terms. You know, I figured so, out a just, way just to improve it. If uh, a disclaimer, don't write down everything Colton says. So you don't want to tell people you're out of town when you're not. But so yeah. if I'm an agent, and I'm listening and I, I think this is brilliant. By the way, there is a national company. Uh, I'm not selling anybody's services. It's called Curbio. Uh, and, and I don't know, I'm not recommending them. I'm not endorsing them. They'll do something similar to this. I would imagine the cost would be a little bit higher, but think about this just for a minute. Even if you if you were an agent and you can't understand how you could get the work done to help somebody improve it and you know how you might very well pay for it, as a minimum resource, you could help them understand exactly what needs to be done and you could help them find the vendors that in many cases they can pay for themselves to, to improve that house, which I would imagine more and Michelle is probably similar to how you do it. You go in, you help them understand specifically, you, you help them with the vendors. Am I correct, more and Michelle? So, so you're helping them with that same service, even though you're not providing it. So anyway, Colton, let's pick back up. Anything else you want to tell us just about the basics of the program? The basics are, I'm not trying to recreate your house. I'm not trying to make your house the Taj Mahal. And, and, and the first question is, is well, are we, um, do I have any say in the updates? I'm perfectly clear with them. No. <laughs> because I'm not updating this house for you. Right. Very important. I'm not updating this for you. I'm updating this for the biggest buyer pool for your house. We're keeping things neutral. We're focusing on bang for the buck. Where am I going to invest the most money to get the best return? I'm not updating everything. And a lot of times I tell people, no, you're wasting your money doing that. No, we don't need to do that because you're not going to get an ROI. Well, two things. Number one, it's like I'm spending their money like it's mine because it is mine up front. I'm spending my own money to get this work done. I don't want them to waste their money on something, even though I am getting paid back. So I really focus on the things, the general flooring, general paint, kitchens, bathrooms, the things that are getting to get them the biggest return on investment. I tell people all the time, I go into the house with my buyer glasses on and I, and I, and I invite the sellers to do the same. Put your buyer glasses on. Now let's make this an appealing house for the massive pool of buyers. What a, a couple great concepts. Number one, we're not trying to play to you specifically, Mr. Seller. We're trying to play to whatever will give us the biggest buyer pool. That is wonderful words to use when you're face to face uh, with a seller. And I heard somebody Colton the other day, and you tell me whether or not you like this. I heard them say, hey, I follow the two, three or four program. And the seller says, what does that mean? Two, three or four. I'm only going to suggest investments that you can get either $2, $3 or $4 for every dollar you spend. And yeah. the seller was like, oh, how do I get on the four program? And I know that's not always possible. How much extra money would you say your typical seller walks away from closing with after using your program versus just leaving in the same condition and selling it? And you might not even know this might be an unfair question. It, it, it's it's an unfair question and, and only in the sense that um, you're asking it. No, just kidding. Oh, okay. No, it's an unfair question because there's no real baseline that we can determine it by. I can have an opinion yeah. of where that house started. So yeah. we just I just did one here uh, uh, this weekend. In my opinion, the house would have a hard time selling at about 450, okay. um, but it might sell at 450. So that's my base point. Okay. So in my opinion, it needed about $55,000 worth of work. And this is a complete remodel. I mean, a complete gut. Big deal. In my opinion, it's going to then get them about a 575 list price. Now, what it will sell for, I, 
only the market will tell us that once it's already put in sold status. So there's a little bit of estimation involved, yes. but in this case, they're going to make an extra $90,000 by doing the update before you list, which will allow her to take a little time off to make that move to Florida with her grandkids and her daughter. And it won't, and she doesn't have to immediately try to find a job. She can actually take a little time off. Let's just say that we don't get 575. Let's say we strike out and get 550. 550. She's still going to get an additional $50,000 at, and that's after paying the $55,000 back. Yep. Yep. Which is amazing. And when you think about it, there's very few times in life we get to earn money uh, virtually tax-free or really tax-free. And it's when you sell that principal residence after you've been there two of the last five years. I mean, yeah. so that $50,000 would be like her earning eighty dollars or $90,000 or, or $70,000 for sure. So, I, But that comes up in the, real quick, Cleve, that comes up in the net sheet. That comes up in the net sheet and, and it's a perfect, oh, well, hey, this guy said he'll charge 1% to list my house or he'll do a flat fee of this. I love it when they say that because I say, let's look at the net sheet. How much are you really saving by going with them? As far as I'm concerned, you're going to lose $50,000 by going with them. It, 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 that's that's another tactical part of my listing presentation. Isn't that brilliant? Because you're selling bushels of apples compared to one apple. Like it's like there's no comparison at all. Um, Charette just asked if we were if she would get a copy of the recorded presentation, and the answer is yes. Riz Media, RIS Media, will actually send out a full webinar, a full uh, video of this webinar, and you can go back and watch it as many times as you'd like. Michelle, yes, ma'am. Yeah, Colton, have you ever had the situation where you've gone in and d done all of the work, and the seller doesn't want to sell? Well, we have. It's called a love it or list it. I'm sure you've seen the TV show. We have the ability to do a love it or list it. So uh, there has been times where we upgrade the house and then we start kind of looking for houses for them. And they're like, Colton, oh we actually love the house now. And we're not seeing anything within the realm of our affordability that we are going to like this much. We want to stay. Okay, no problem. And at that point, we have a decision to make. Do you want terms? And I can provide them with terms on repaying it. Can you reimburse the full cost of, of the work? Or we help them do like either a home equity line of, of credit or they do a refinance cash out and they pay for the construction right then and there. And they choose to love the house instead of list it. That's a cool option. And think about this. You you two ladies are just experts at social media and all kinds of marketing. Can you imagine, you know, having a social media campaign that says, hey, you're looking to sell your house, but you think it's kind of sad and tired. And you know, you could sell it for a lot more if you made it happy and smiley. We've got a program to do that. Now I'm just making up terms, but you would get a lot of people that would interact with you on social media if you had an offer like that. Am I right or wrong, ladies? No, I, I know people that would sign up in a second for that service right now if it was offered in our market. I think it's a fantastic uh, idea, and I think you're doing a great job. I love that. I Thank love you. that. Okay, so let, let's keep going. Let's talk value. And and you mentioned earlier you might not have anything else to uh, to to say about this, but but when you deliver value, it helps you keep your commission rate up. We're certainly not discussing what commission should be, um, you know, on a national level. But but how, how does it help you justify, you know, getting a, a full fee or whatever it is compared to the, to this compared to the discounters? Well, uh, what's funny is that a lot of times when people are, are, you know, in the rat race, there's a book called Blue Oceans and, uh, you know, it, it, Red Ocean is where everybody's fighting over everything and it's just a bloody war over, over you know, four and a half percent, four percent, five percent. Well, I've created a blue ocean with this program where I'm not really competing with anybody. So there's there's multiple listings this year. We've done seven percent. I had one of my agents that's on my team that also can provide this service by being on my team, uh, got an eight percent commission, was fully transparent of everything and was able to be. And at the end, you know what the client said? Do I owe you any more for the like? That's because, guys, in the absence of value, the only thing that you can do is reduce your commission. That Say is it so again. True. In the absence of value, all you can do is negotiate your commission. So when you're providing this type of value that can create more wealth for the client, more, you know, top line revenue for the client, what's really the discussion? If you make 8%, but you still net $60,000 more than anybody else can provide you with, what are we really negotiating? 
Absolutely. And we're not certainly talking about fixing commissions or suggesting that you charge those, but the reality is, is sort of the sky is the limit. You can charge whatever you believe your services uh, are worth if you're delivering enough value. And I'd like and to- And it's the client's choice. It's the client's choice because it's negotiable. And that's the whole, that's the, the argument to what you're, you know, you're protecting us against yeah. is it's the client's choice. You know that's what? Right. I have clients that chose 8%. I've had clients do this program at four and a half percent, you know? So it's their choice their or- choice they can go with another agent because I know my value. And I think they should, agents, anybody who's listening should take this concept and get really serious about how are they delivering value in today's market. And I'm not saying that everybody can deliver value um, in the unique way you are delivering it, Colton, but there are so many ways to deliver value. I heard someone on the buyer side of the business the other day say, hey, one of the things we do is after you go under contract, we send you a surrounding area search and this agent proceeded to tell a story about home buyers buying homes in a neighborhood that was adjacent to a rock quarry. And then every Thursday at one o'clock, boom, when the dynamite blast went off and it only went off for <clears throat> just a couple of minutes and then it would stop, these people would learn, oh my gosh, my property is adjacent to a rock, a rock quarry. And so they just, this agent just sends them a surrounding area search, which is just a Google area map, aerial map, with a five mile radius radius and it says hey colton take a look at this map and if you see anything on here you don't understand big holes bodies of water things you don't understand let us know and let's research that and i thought now see that is adding additional value with something that's very simple that anybody could do so we all need to think about adding value even if we are not able to do something like what i call a rehab and refresh program and what you call is improve before you list is that correct colton update before you sell Update before you sell. I almost had it. I almost had it. Update before you sell. Okay. So you um, you are not afraid to be yourself. You are who you are. You're wired up the way you are. You're willing to show that to the world. And so how did you get to where you could sort of be unapologetically unique? I am who I am. This is this is what this is what I want to bring to the table. So it's it's almost kind of you know take it or leave it. I'm you're okay with either one. Well, I. I... I mean, at a certain point, you have to earn the ability to do that because if you're a bull in the china shop with your personality and you and you deflect, you know, you you create this resentment from a lot of people around you, then then it's counterproductive. So I've had to, you know, when I first started, I did a lot of stuff for free. Like I, I did a lot, like I did updates for clients' houses for free. I, I would go to their houses and change fans. I, I, get, I would, I would help invest. The reason I, how I got into flipping houses is I would help investors and I wouldn't charge anything. I would facilitate all this and I would do it for free, not ask for a dime. And then I started to increase my value to people. And, and then once I started getting to a point where I didn't need that person's business to have a successful career well then i started becoming more and more apologetically myself because in the end you always want to do business with people that are more like you um but at, at when you're starting you there's a point where you have to really do what you got to do to get ahead and provide value and it's like my mission statement that's behind me is to my mission is to provide as much value to as many people as possible without any conversation of compensation. So I'm going to do as much as I can for as many people without worrying about money. It's like what Zig Ziglar said, you help enough people get what they want, you will always get what you want. And I started that way. And then eventually, I just got the confidence of, you know what, I am this way. I'm not going to be able to please everybody. And I get that. And I'm comfortable with that. You know, there's a lot of people that aren't comfortable with that. Like they want everybody to love them. And I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not that way. And I'm comfortable with that. And I'm okay with that. Yeah, I love that. And you're upfront about it. And I think it's great advice for a new agent is, hey, when you're first starting, maybe you can't take the concept of, of creating a strong niche market uh, and, and being who you are because you're trying to figure out who you are. And maybe you have to do more business and you have to take whatever comes your way. But wherever you are, if you're on today and you are listening, wherever you are, you need to be creating that sort of band of customers, that people that are uniquely yours that you can communicate with. I can see myself as a seller uh, in uh, Metro Atlanta, and I can see myself having a house that I think needs to be improved. Uh, and, you know, I can see you being able to connect with me specifically based on that. So I really see how that can work. It took seven, seven, eight years for me to create that type of 
you know, come list me situation where people see one of my ads and they DM me or direct message and just say, hey, can you come to my house? I, I got an appointment tomorrow with a guy that got uh, got a Facebook uh, ad contacted me on Facebook and was like, hey, can you come to my house this Thursday? I need some improvements. I need to move to Texas, blah, 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 whatever. It took me seven, eight years to to get to that point. So as a new agent, I had to give away a lot of this for free at first to build that reputation to where now, you know, it, it, it come list me calls happen because of exactly what you just said. People see the value in it and they need it. And, and, that, and that's Love where it. I've kind of the niche I've fell in. Yeah, love it. And before we get to more, Michelle, we're going to get into social media and how to build your brand, your unique brand on social media and something I know everybody will relate to. I want to close with, you know, you're pretty serious about your business. And sometimes you think people in real estate or it, it seems like you think people in real estate are not quite as serious as they should be about building their business. Let's talk a little bit about that as we close up your section. So you're either committed or you're just or this is just a hobby to you. Um, and it's something that we we talked about, um, you know, I, I liken it to um, if you guys have all seen the movie 300. Uh, uh, it's I mean, it's maybe not a, a show for everybody. But one, one of the things that happens in this movie is that he meets up with one of his buddies in this uh, uh, that where they're getting ready to go to war. And his buddy has a whole bunch more. His 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 army is way bigger uh, than Spartacus is. But Spartacus says, listen. Who, what do you do? What's your profession? And he says, oh, I'm a pot ma maker. What, what's your profession? Oh, I'm an iron worker. And he turns around and looks at his army of badass Spartans and says, what is your profession? And they have, in unison just give this loud like, oh, oh, their profession is warriors. And because they're committed to that. Too many times, and I hate saying it sometimes, I feel weird, but too many times agents are mothers or they're, you're a wife or you're a this or you're a that. You're, and you're putting your own needs behind all these other things. Now, there's a way to balance it out, but at what comes first is there's a reason in the airplanes, Cleve, they say put your mask on first, right? Yeah. If you take care of your business the way you should, Everything that's around you will kind of fill itself in and, and will take care of itself. And so uh, I, I'm very, very direct with my agents. You're, you're either committed or you're not. Right. And, and, and so and it goes a lot with social media in order for everybody else to see that you're committed to your business. You, you can you can get out in your front yard and yell it. I'm committed. But only your neighbors are going to think you're weird. But if you're on social media constantly showing people you're committed to your business and you're and you're and you're comfortable doing that, people are going to take you serious and they're going to look at you as the the the, the real estate professional. That is your profession, and people will know that. And the more people that know that, the more people are going to refer you and use you. Such good information. I know that some of the ten attendees are going to take this concept of helping people improve their properties or do a, you know, flip, a, flip, a, flip your house yourself, basically, concept uh, in their area. And I appreciate you sharing very open, openly and genuinely uh, with us. Now we're moving on to more and Michelle. And my first question for you two, same as we asked Colton originally, is why do you need to have a specific market niche? Why do you need to focus on a specific segment of the market and not the entire market together? I agree with everything Colton said. I mean, I took some good notes. Um, so thank you, Colton. I like your program too. But I think it goes back to quality over quantity. And my quality relationships are not going to be the same quality relationships Colton has or the same quality relationships Moore has. My quality relationships are going to be like-minded people that are similar to me. So I, I would take that all day, every day. You have that right off the bat, that loyalty, the trust, and all the things to make a successful transaction from beginning to end. Whereas sometimes when you have that quantity and you're trying to cover so much ground, you're not doing anything really well. So what's interesting is as you said that, I thought, okay, higher quantity, lower quality. And then I thought lower quantity, higher quality, because if you have less people you're dealing with, you can really connect with them in some real ways. And I love that because you were saying, in my opinion, the same thing Colton was saying is when you start with people you're connected, there's less friction 
in that process. Yeah. They get you and you get hundred percent loyal. All yeah. of my clients become my friends, become my res like referral sources. I mean, they think they're part of my family because it's the quality relationship. I'm able to deliver customer service and really care about their needs. So their loyalty goes hand in hand. I'm their real estate agent for life. The social media and all of the other things that we do are just touch points reminding them every time they think real estate, my name's the first thing that comes to mind. I love that. Yeah, More, how about you? Example. Yes, I'll please. give you an example for quick. So, you know, I figured this out only recently how people say that business is done on the golf course and I'm not a golfer, I'm a poker player. But um, and, a, and a very good one, I might add, one who actually scares the crap out of me every time I'm around her <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to poker. <laughs> but when you think about why business is done at the golf course, it's because people like to also talk to people that have a shared interest. So when I go sell a property with you, we can also talk about how we did that round of golf last Friday and how you hit us something like this. And we have something that breaks the ice between us and gives us a shared kind of uh, mutual ground to go off of. And believe it or not, people prefer that over um, any other type of connection to a trusted um, professional they work with. Difference to a customer, to a client, and a client-based relationship having a niche market um, actually propels you to have more business rather than less. So we focus very heavily on niche marketing in our team. Love it, love it. And it's because you don't want to be lost. Our first slide is about having interest in common. And I would love if Michelle, you first and then more, if you guys would talk about what, what your niche market is. What do you do? Who is it that you're connecting with? Because I'm sure the audience would love to hear. You know, I'm gonna let more go first on this oh, one just sure. because I think that hers are amazing. I mean, mine are also good, but it kind of oh. speaks to and I'll follow up afterwards. Absolutely, please, more go right ahead. So when people ask me, uh, for example, oh, when I just came into real estate, like what areas do you focus on? I assume that they focus, they meant neighborhoods, but I don't do my business that way. I do my business vertically based on common interests. So for example, I speak Hebrew. So one of my interests in common are people that speak Hebrew, a different language um, that I obviously help um, with their real estate needs. So that gives me one interest in common, which is a different language and a different culture. Um, I'm also a poker player. Um, there are four people that I play poker with that I have, I can share stories about our game last week are as part of my interest in common. Um, I I'm part of a charitable organizations. So I consider the people in those charitable organizations part of my other interests in common. Um, so really the way we define how to get business rather than looking at it on a real estate way, um, we sit with the agents and we pull out a piece of paper and say, draw all of the people and the circles of interest that you have in your life. And let's see how those bring in silos of business from you. So when you're thinking of how am I going to get my next deal? It's not how am I going to get my next deal um, only because this is also important in this geographical neighborhood. It's also let's open your book of business and let's see what about the poker players? Did you do some marketing for them? OK, let's create a charitable poker night for that group. Oh, what about your Hebrew speaking clients? How about we do an event for them or send out a marketing piece to them? So you create direct marketing pieces for people and interests in common that you approach your business that way rather than real estate related. Absolutely. And if I'm not mistaken, I think you take the group of, of people who speak Hebrew that you connect with. And then I think you actually further connect with people who speak Hebrew who also want to invest in real estate. Am I right or wrong? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, 100%. Um, that is definitely the way um, I've managed to grow my business really quickly is that I've started to take my common mm -hmm. groups and then I started to merge them together and to bring more groups where the referral gets much much quicker and much faster because then you become so specific that you think you're not going to get a lot of business because you're that specific. But hey, now I'm the Hebrew speaking investment poker player agent and people hear about you really quickly that way and you get business from people that don't even care that you're, even if they're not speaking Hebrew, even if they don't play poker or, or focus in investments, they reach out to you because your name reaches further out and you're top of mind. I love that. And I look at it and I say simply, if you want to connect with people who like poker, just talk about poker. If you want to connect with people who speak Hebrew, maybe write in Hebrew and that will connect with them. I'm not saying you want to exclude everybody, yeah. but the ways for you to connect with these groups are really fairly simple and straightforward. More thanks so much, Michelle. Any other comments before we go to Michelle? 
Well, and just the things that you like in general too. I mean, I like to golf. I like to be outside. I'm a Denver native. So all of those areas give me different silos to kind of bring in people. It's back to what Colton said, where Colton said, it's like being unapologetically yourself. It's be like, this is who I am. I'm not going to try and be your standard American realtor in Denver, Colorado, trying to fit in. I am the Hebrew speaking Israeli loud agent. And I'm, that's who I am. If you don't want to work with me, you probably shouldn't if we're not going to work out. You're not, more. you're not loud. Never, never, never. I love that. When more yeah, is in the room. Like I can't change the package. So if, if you don't like it, it's not going to work. But what's interesting too, by the way, is why should you change the package? I know a lot of people, and, and I'm sorry to delve off into this, but a lot of people really want to fit in with everybody. They want to just fit in with, that, that is so stressful because what happens is they spend all their, all their time not being themselves and more, uh, you know, you and I've only been together uh, in the same room one time and you're exactly the same in person as you are on Zoom, as you are on the phone, you're just wired up and ready to go. And the reality is the more people know that, the more they love it anyway, even if they didn't like it the very first day, they would get to know you and get to love you and appreciate you even more. I think that's very important. Thanks for, for helping everybody understand more about how they can be themselves. Yes, Michelle. Well, and that goes back to like, I started in real estate 17 years ago and the company I was with, you know, we all kind of wore this type of outfit. We did our geo farming. We did this, we did this. So we were really trying to kind of fit the mold. And this is before social media, before yes. we had time to really express ourselves. So I was on a partnership and then when I went on my own, I kind of felt a little bit lost because that wasn't really who I am or spoke to what I wanted to do. And you kind of lose a little bit of that passion. And I feel like your clients 100% feel it as well. So following your passion, following your likes, following those, those items, not saying that geo farming is not still part of our business plan like we still geo farm we still have it's just another tool take sure. those silos of what traditional salespeople have done in the past and it's been effective we just put our own spin on it we put our own flavor on it we put our own personalities into it love it one time we were in a meeting with your entire group and we, we i think we were talking about instagram at the time forgive me i am a social media baby i don't have to like to read what i write myself on social media so i've got i got to learn from you guys but you had something like collectively a hundred and something thousand followers on instagram or something like that so let's talk about how you become an influencer there you on your team you have i believe five agents right now uh, and each one of those agents has a different brand, if you will. So they're blogging, they're posting on social media and they're being who they are. So let's talk about what your personal brands are and then maybe some of the other brands of the agents on your team. Sure. Yeah. So um, what we uh, basically have is that every one of our agents going back to having that personal common interest um, is going to it basically comes to the table with our business plan and chooses a passion of theirs that they love and we assign them that niche so nobody can come into in within our team and try and grab that uh so we have olivia who she's the denver look and she focuses on fashion blogging love it uh, we she's have a model fashion model okay. and um go ahead michelle no go ahead sorry uh, May, no, you're good. Um, yeah. Maytal, um, she actually uh, is the Denver mama. And interestingly enough, I'm going to bring this up. You know, Maytal came to us. She was the Denver mama. She decided she wanted to focus on children. She's got a son. He's three years old. Um, he's so sweet. Um, and she wanted to be a Denver mama. And then she came up to us recently. She's like, you know what, guys? I really love EDM music. Um, I go to EDM concerts. I'm really, I want to be a DJ maybe on the side. And I really think about changing my brand to take on that as a brand. And you know what? That's, that's okay, guys. And we're, we're Maytel is going to, was the done for mama and she's finding passion in EDM music. And it's all about being true to who you are. So she's going to change her brand probably to become something related to music and DJs, or whatever that is. And that's the whole point, the finding your influence of what you love. Um, we have Andrea who loves the outdoors. She's the Denver outdoors. She does all of the skiing, climbing, rock climbing, all that stuff. Um, she kind of does events on that. Michael yep. Ann is going to do cuisine. So she just started her blog this year and that's going to be like fine food in Denver, restaurants, uh, places to go out and eat and drink. 
Um, I do the Denver Ear, which is an event kind of local um, lifestyle blog in Denver. Um, and Michelle does a luxury brand that is a, a kind of like an exclusive network luxury brand um, that's not to the masses. That's just a kind of within our client base. Um, and the point is, it really is when you come to the team, it's not just about what's your real estate, what's your passion is part of our business plan. You're going to tell us what you love to do. And from there, we're going to find out how we're going to get your clients that work and love what so you're going to make money off of what you love to do. Yeah. Love that. And you know, they come to the table with, uh, here's my passion, but they probably don't know how to build a following, how to build an audience. And so this is not a class about how to build a social media audience, but what would be a few tips that you would give someone on how to constantly increase the number of followers you have, friends, connections, whatever it might be. Be authentic to who you are. And if you love it, then there are other people that also love it and have that common interest. Okay. And is there anything special in terms of the timing of your posting and the way you're encouraging people to interact? Are you doing anything fancy, if you will, or, or, or uh, slick behind the scenes? Or are you just being real and just getting out there and posting about your passions? I can tell you a good quick way to build a kind of a group of following, which is not trying to focus on getting Instagram followers. It's okay. kind of, um, I found that um, opening a Facebook group of people that you continuously market to in some way or another um, and you create a following that way is going to grow you a big community and I've seen realtors that did it quicker than us what they did is and that's why I want to give respect to a faster quicker way it's where they go on Facebook they create a community and they start building that community within and then people start to rely on their posts they're both the influence and they put mostly real estate in there and then they move that following then follow me on Instagram. And it's easier to have a pre-built community that you transition to a new platform and Facebook groups is a great way to start there. I love that. And then do they, are they just targeting people or putting people in the group who are already in their friends group? They're in saying, hey, there's 30. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. For example, I'm starting this idea now. I'm opening an investment Facebook group where I'm bringing in to that group everybody that I know that's interested in investment real estate that I can start sending them in one group on Facebook investment properties that they can always look at. And um, they were just starting to invite their friends. So it's happening organically because people always want to see more deals that are coming soon, especially in investment real estate. People always want the off market deals that come on. They'll feel it's like added value. And I mean, I think just putting just moving that bracket to another following, that's an influencer already. When you can influence a big group of people under only you in one platform, you're an influencer, in my opinion. And the key, it sounds like, is providing value. So you put the group together, you provide things that are valuable to the group, whatever that group's interests are, and then it just naturally grows on its own. What a, what a great tip. Anything else, when, Michelle? When Moore started the Denver Ear, it basically, Moore, you should talk about how you started the Denver Ear and what it, what it, like why people always go back to the blog. Cause I know like when Halloween comes out, the Denver Ear wrote an article, I can't even tell you, what was it, four or five years ago about the top fall festivals or pumpkin patches. And every year I Google that article and I go through it. I'm like, okay, which one do you want to go to this year? And so it kind of, yeah, so when I started real estate, um, it was really traditional. Everyone sent out real estate blog articles of what to, when to put your clock back one hour and how to clean your front porch for fall. And I thought to myself, first of all, this is boring as shit. And second of all, uh, <laughs> second of all, like, I mean, I get it from every other realtor. Why would I want to be one of those that send that to everybody? I want valuable content that I care about that I would actually read. So I decided that I'm not going to write about real estate whatsoever. I'm going to write about things that I care about, community-based events. So what can I do with this, my kids this weekend? Where can I go buy a pumpkin for a pumpkin patch in Denver? Like, tell me things that I'm actually searching for in my community because I figured that if I buy real estate in that community, I want to know what's going on around it. It's very important value. And more importantly, that once my clients close a deal with me, I mean, how often are they going to open your newsletter about um, the fall kind of updates for your house when they just bought a house? They're probably not going to be interested for at least three to five years in this content. So then you lost them. Here, my clients continuously open my newsletters and read my articles because they can't, they're still relevant. It's about finding your next Halloween haunted house. I mean, it's coming up. You need to go find a Halloween haunted house every year. 
And then putting that and making the Denver ear um, only sponsored by Team Denver Homes. So I mean, Team Denver Homes is basically the number one provider for the Denver ear. So everyone that's on there knows that we're the real estate team for it, allows us to market as a big niche marketing. And the Denver ear has over 1 million unique visitors a year. That's amazing. And Michelle, before you jump in just real quick, I think it's one of the more popular lifestyle blogs in your area. I don't know that yes. for sure, but I, I have certainly yeah. heard that. And by the way, I have to, I have to tell you, uh, Annie made a comment and the comment was very simply, love her exclamation point. And Annie, <laughs> I will tell you, you are not alone. Her enthusiasm no, is yes. absolutely contagious. I'm sorry, Michelle, I stopped you from, from speaking. No, I was just saying that that was, you know, that was such a great idea that we took that and applied it in all of the brands that our agents have. So Olivia every year comes out with like right around the beginning of December, a shopping guide. I mean, that fits her Denver, the Denver look, yes. her fashion blog, and that shopping guide every year I pull it up. I look at what she's recommending. She also does like local boutiques and who to support. So there's always valuable content that keeps our clients going back for more. Totally love it. Hey, Colton, are you listening to this and thinking, hey, there's a lot of things that I could do to even build a larger audience and following just around what's interesting to me? Yeah, 100 percent. And then there's a reason why these girls are rock stars. And it's but it also comes down to uh, consistency. I mean, more it wouldn't have the success she has if she just did a blog and then was like, oh, that didn't really work. It took her years to establish that. And that's what I see a lot of new agents. They, they're like, oh, I tried an open house. It didn't work. Okay, we'll try a hundred more. You know, I did a blog. I didn't get any followers. Okay, we'll do two thousand more, and then then you will be the source. Colton, that was a conversation we had on our team, and we have it pretty regularly. When I speak to the agents and we talk about, you know, what works, what doesn't work, consistency is always something that comes up. And I think you're right. Coming in as a new agent, you have again so many options. You're trying to figure out who you are, trying to figure out how to define yourself, but just picking one or two of these ideas and doing it over and over and over, you're not going to see a big return until I would say at least a year, give it a year, yeah. a full year. If you still don't like it, come back to me. We'll go to the drawing board and we'll figure it out, but yeah. give it a year. Give it a year. And, yeah. and not just that, it's so on point because I did a Denver ear for a full year. I had no clients. I thought it was, I thought I was, it was the worst idea ever, but I didn't give up. I said, you know what? It can't be because I'm interested in reading my own articles. I'm not giving up. And right, right a moment after I almost gave up was actually when it started to, to get a lot of traction. I tell, uh, I tell my agents all the time. Yeah. In it, it when it rains it pours especially yes. in our industry because right. like uh more i have agents that have like they're the realtor to the dogs and they did this stuff and they're working and working and working and i could see the work because numbers don't lie i could see them right. putting in the work i see it and i'm like listen keep going you're get your close you're gonna you're gonna burst and right when he was getting kind of he called a meeting with me he's like you know maybe this isn't gonna work i, I don't know i just i'm not getting much traction i go keep going with it like we were just talking about our team meeting today because we we're talking about consistency and your focus and i said within 30 days of him being discouraged and almost given up he had he put seven into escrow and four of them were from dog events that he got boots at and since then he's closed i mean he's been our top producer for the last two years straight because he stayed true to who he was and he stayed focused and committed um so yeah 100 percent we always talk about like, happens, plant those seeds and just keep watering the garden. Plant those yep. seeds and water, water, water. You can't. And it, it's but it's so, it's so hard for most people to do that because they they don't necessarily see how, how the future will come together. And you know what? We we kind of start out from places where we're not absolutely sure we know what we're doing anyway. And I'm sure more for the first year you were thinking I'm I'm trying. I'm doing the best I can. But you believed and you just kept going. You knew you had something uh, to deliver, and you actually stuck with it until you got it done. Let's jump in. We've only got about six minutes left in today's presentation. Let's talk just quickly about geographic niche. Niche. Then we've got one additional topic for you guys. So you're still doing some geographic farming. And a lot of people would say, well, that's not a niche. Well, yes, it is. Because when you're farming a specific geographic area, those people share something in common. And that is the geographic area. So talk about that. They're neighbors. They na they're neighbors. They shop at the same stores. They go to the si same dry cleaners. They want a hairstylist. They want contractors. So a geographic niche is something we very much focus 
in on as one of our silos. Um, oftentimes our geographic niche follows where we live. Got it. And so, so you're in it yourself. So if you're going to pick one, maybe you pick one where you live because then you know it better than everybody else. Great, great or advice. Where you live. Yes. And then what, what are you doing? Are you mailing to them? Are you doing some social media posts trying to target a different geographic area? Talk to us about what you're doing. We're doing all of the above. We kind okay. of spread ourselves. So we're emailing, we're mailing, we're doing publications that are in that specific neighborhood for that neighborhood. And then we're doing events that support the local businesses around that neighborhood in the neighborhood. So in all ways, we're trying to give back charity events in the neighborhood. Right now we have a canned food drive in our specific neighborhoods and our sphere niche. Mm -hmm. So when I saw you guys last, I was actually, the last night I was staying in Aurora. And so that's a suburb of, of Denver. And so you could actually, you know, focus on a specific area. And even if you did, here's what's happening more in this specific area and you just kept doing it for that area, eventually you would probably grow a pretty good following. Colton, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I, I mean, in reality, what it comes down to is, um, we talked about it again today, uh, Steve Jobs, he said, in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to be insane. You have to be insane to be a successful entrepreneur for what we're talking about right now. Like more took a year of fail, 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 fail. What's the definition of insanity? You do the same thing over and over and again and expect a different result. Well, guess what? As an entrepreneur, that's ex that's precisely what we do. We fail, we fail, we fail, we learn, we learn, we learn. Next thing you know, we're an overnight success. They don't see all the failure that went into this. So like Steve Jobs says, you have to be insane to be a successful entrepreneur. And that, and that comes from doing the mundane, boring things consistently year after year. And then, and then you become an overnight success. That's, that's what it comes yeah. down to. And I want to give a little translation to the definition of insane because I agree with that. But I think what he meant was this. You have to be so different that you almost have to ignore what other people think about it as you're doing it. And by the way, that makes most of us think that there's some insanity. When I think about the three different niche markets, I look at it and I say, more is all about how to have more fun in life living in Denver. I say, Michelle is Robin Leach's lifestyles of the rich and famous. I don't even know that that has anything to do because you're probably just talking about luxury properties, but that's what came to mind. And then I look at Colton and I say, hey, don't let anybody else have your money. If it's your home and it's your equity, you can't let anybody else get in there. And those are three messages that are so specific. I want to talk just quickly before we close up about finding other niches. Uh, Colton mentioned somebody who focuses on dogs. Michelle, you mentioned dog parks. I know yours is luxury. Uh, more yours is buyer types. You can have uh, niche groups that are all about schools or about gardening or anything else. Any other suggestions about things that people could, topics that people could use to create a niche, a niche market? Well, I would say there was there was one agent in Arizona that um, like and, and, and it goes both ways because this guy was covered in tattoos from head to toe. You, you guys have may have he's actually been in some publications and stuff, but he's completely into like taboo stuff and he's totally open about it. And his first year in real estate with all of that going on and, and really just leaning into it, he closed like something like 40 transactions or something. And I'm thinking to myself, just from the picture, I would never do a transaction with somebody that looked like that. But, but, and like I told one of my friends, I said, yeah, he closed 40 transactions with people that, that he connected with, but he also probably gave up a little bit of business from people that he may not have connected with, but he was comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So sometimes your niche might take like with more a year to catch on, but that, but she stayed true to herself. And like, and like somebody once said, your vibe will attract your tribe. And just you know, don't, be, don't be afraid to put money into your marketing. For example, for when I was doing my marketing in the beginning, I made poker chips and I did my information as a team Denver homes and like embossed on the poker chip. So when I would sit at the poker table and I wanted to hand my friends instead of a business card, I throw them each a chip from my new poker chip stack and people would go nuts for it and they would keep it because they got a little poker chip from me. And I invested money in my niche marketing with products that are related to my niece. So if you're a golfer, 
maybe invest in a little golf ball or whatever it is. Try to focus on your groups with your swag and all the pieces that you spend money on too. Love it. Yeah. We've got a couple quick list, listener questions. And the first one is, uh, can you have more than one niche? And I think the answer is yes. Would you agree with that? All, all of the panelists, you can have more than one. I would guess it probably make more sense to focus on one and then expand to two or three so you can get the first one right to begin with. Uh, and then the next question is, Colton, for you, uh, what legal contracts do you have in place to do the flip? I would assume you have some kind of note or some kind of deed or something that people are signing. Maybe it's just in the listing agreement that shows you're going to get paid back. So uh, the way that we did it was we have a contract that is that turns into a basically a deed on the house. So if they decide to love it, that's fine. It will turn into a note um, that is enforceable. Um, worst case scenario, buy foreclosure. But it's not like that's the like I'm going to give every single possible out for them. And as long as they're working with me, just give me 10 bucks a month. I don't care as long as you're working with me. I'll work back, but it is going to become a note on the property. Um, and if you're not working with me, it isn't enforceable by foreclosure. Perfect. Hopefully that answers those questions. Maura, Michelle, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, uh, possibly to send a referral your way, how would they do that? Michelle? Okay. <laughs> I would okay. like our, our Instagram is at Team Denver Homes or okay. Either one of us email more at Team Denver Homes or Michelle at Team Denver Homes, and our website is teamdenverhomes.com. Perfect. Colton, how about you? If somebody's got business that they want to refer to somebody in Las Vegas, and I would assume the greater Las Vegas area, how would they do that? Uh, I mean, for me, I'm, I know Instagram is the more, in, I'm old school with Facebook. So I'm, I, I like Facebook. So if you, uh, Colton Simmons, Colton with a Y, C-O-L-T-Y-N Simmons, um, you can Facebook message me. Um, Custom Fit Real Estate is our company, uh, Facebook. You can message us there. Our website is simplehomesearch.com, but that goes to our CRM. So it won't necessarily you won't be able to get me. Um, you can you can private message me. Hell, even call me. I don't care. 702-408-4891. One of my uh, one of my uh, you know I, I guess it's a curse, but I'm always working. Uh, my wife hates it, but she loves all of her purses and she loves her new cars. So and she hates that I work so much, but she loves riding around in a brand new Escalade and stuff. Like that. So she's cool with it. She's cool with it. Um, uh, so. Um, yeah, I, I'm always working and I, and there's more, there's enough business for everybody. So I'm always willing to help and, and, and do whatever I can. Cause like I said, in the very beginning, the, the more you help other people, the more you're always going to have what you need. So. And the better you're going to Mindset is a, a very important for success too. It, because yeah. and it makes you feel better about yourself to, to yeah. just feel better. So if you want to get, a couple of free downloads that'll be very helpful for you. Go to workmansuccess.com forward slash your niche, workmansuccess.com forward slash your niche. We've got a little error on this slide and you can download the full Workman Success Systems business plan workbook, which you can use to light your business on fire in 2022. And you can download a document, a three page document that says, follow these steps to find your niche. And it could be that that niche, niche is your ticket to success in 2022. Maura and Michelle, thank you so much for being here. You've given such great information and I love the energy that you brought. And Colton, you brought an entirely different flavor, but I love your passion around what you're doing. And I know that all three of you are helping people in your own unique ways in your market area. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll talk to you next, next month on the RIS Media Agent Series webinar. Take care. See you later. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Colton. Yeah. It was fun to hear. All right.